Welcome to today's seminar on data leadership, co-hosted by the Harvard Data Science Initiative and the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. This is the second in a series of four conversations this spring with industry on topics related to data, ethics, and leadership. So special thanks to our colleagues at McKinsey & Company for their help in organizing. Today's seminar is being introduced by Professor Jim Waldo. Jim? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Waldo. I'm a professor of computer science at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I am also a professor of technology policy over at the uh, Kennedy School. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce this particular uh, session. We are going to be talking about really a central problem of trust. Uh, trust in uh, in in digital platforms and in general trust in security, trust in privacy. Really, trust is a central notion around some of the major questions having to do with technology and society, and it's one of these things that has been pretty seriously eroding over the last couple of years. So now is a a really opportune time to talk about this. I am delighted to be able to introduce our panel here. We start off with Daniel uh, Debrodowski. Daniel is a member of the World Economic Forum. He is a lawyer. He is a graduate of the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. I actually had him in a class. It was uh, delightful to see him again. Daniel has been working on the uh, trust framework at the World Economic Forum, and he will be interviewed by Liz uh, Grennan. Liz is uh, a, a member of the McKinsey Digital Practice, uh, an expert in a lot of these areas. I am going to try to get out of the way and let the two of them go at it. So Liz, Daniel, it's all yours. Thanks, Jim. Great to be with you on this chat. Daniel, great to, as always, talk to you. It's been um, it's been such a kindred spirit um, experience in in all the time I've known you. So thanks all for talking about this topic. I'm I'm hopeful that you in in the listening audience will be also very eager to learn about trust, to contribute to the trust, um, you know, thought leadership that is being developed because we are in a time when it's just very very needed. So much exciting innovation happening. We are seeing it on all the headlines especially with generative AI, which we'll talk to you uh, later during the session. But um, Daniel, you are leading this effort for the World Economic Forum and doing an amazing job. Um, and I'd love to understand from you, just to set the baseline, what do you and what should others think of when we say digital trust? It can mean a lot of things. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the folks at Harvard for having us for this conversation. I think, you know, when we talk about being kindred spirits about how we think about digital trust, um, ultimately, we want decision makers to understand what it means to be trustworthy in their use of technology. So when you think about digital trust, first, drop the digital out of it for a moment and just think about trust. Ultimately, what does it mean to earn trust as a, as a partner, as, a, as an individual, as a company? And fundamentally, it means to meet people's expectations and the values that they hold. And so when you think about digital trust, it means when you're making decisions around technology, you need to meet people, recognize what their values are in the use of those technologies, and then help them to understand that the way you're deciding how to apply, how to implement new technologies, how to develop new technologies and services actually help uphold those societal expectations and values. So it's really a matter of meeting people's expectations that they already have. And, and that helps build that trust. And Daniel, I have heard many times, um, so my background is a lawyer as well. I have been for 20 years and, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, let's just make it fair or let's de-bias something. And, and I hear them and I love the sentiment and I think it's the right approach. And, and, um, and I personally find it vocational, as I've said, but I think it's hard to say what does fairness mean? What does, who trusts what, for what reasons? What, what is it, is it subjective? And in my legal mind, and I'm sure in yours and many others in the audience as well, it's, it, you want to tie it to existing, you know, legal requirements and, and regulations. But is there something where we can all agree that there's something required here for an organization to have trust? Like, is it just cyber or is this, is this something broader here in, in, in the, as you broaden the concept of trust? 
Yeah, I think it, it, it comes from cyber and just, just like cyber and you know, anti-biasing fairness. I wish we could just do that. I wish we could just be secure. We could just be fair, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of thought to make that happen. So when we think about digital trust at the forum and kind of with our global partners who developed this definition and the framework that we'll talk about together, um, we recognize that it does it does come out of cyber because for any for any digital system, if you can't ensure the cybersecurity of that system, you have no business making claims to trustworthiness. Um, but it's it's so much more than cyber, right? It's about again going back to expectations. People have expectations about yes, the security of their data, but also the privacy of their their personal information and data. They also have expectations around whether it's used fairly, the interoperability of these systems, um, and a host of other issues that cover everything from security to governance to inclusivity and ethics um, that have to be recognized as part of the overall sort of digital trust conversation. And that's what we tried to, to build out through this definition and the framework that we developed. I mean, one thing I loved about getting to work with you, Daniel, is when we first talked I think both of us were lit. I was, I certainly was lit up by the thought that we both defined it the same way. When we say digital trust, we're saying, okay, well, what is trust in a digital, digitally driven economy? If we've got all of these organizations and everyone has got you know, just, just so much data, unprecedented amounts and unprecedented amounts of compute power. So, you know, and ways to manipulate the data and ways to gain insights from the data and tons of incentive to gain those insights and use them. What does it mean? Like, is it digital products and services? Is it a, is it a general feeling of they're going to do the right thing? And I guess what comes to mind for me when I think about it, I think about are they is an organization trustworthy with our data? And I shift to consumer very easily. I think we all can. Are they trustworthy? Will they take care of my data? And what are they doing with technology? And we'll use the term use cases, which sounds kind of consultant deep, but but I think we need to analyze some of this on the use case level because we are floating, folks are floating ideas in the kind of innovation space that are really radical at the moment um, that go far beyond the self-driving car trolley program um, problem. So I think it, it is useful to get into some of the details um, when we say tr trust. And so I guess maybe I'll pass to you to say, maybe you defi define the framework. What has the World Economic Forum decided goes into this? What will you study? What will you what will you focus on? Yeah, I think you know, listen, it's been it's been great kind of talking through this issue and and working through it with you, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to share this with the wider group. Ultimately, trust is is sort of a system. How you build trust and how you earn it, and we specifically, you know, talk about earning trust, not just not just being given it. It's not a, it's not granted that you're going to get it, but in order to earn that trust. Um, the way we th thought about it, with it, and again, the forum is a multi-stakeholder organization. So, with our partners, including you know, places like McKinsey and, and other companies, um, but also uh, government agencies like the uh, European Commission, the U.S. Department of Commerce, the government of Singapore, and others, we talked about digital trust as um, a sort of decision-making framework here, and, and and we describe it as a set of goals. Which, if you're looking at the the slide in front of you, that's the outer ring. And then a, a set of dimensions or ways that you achieve those goals. And in order for a, a technological system, we realize to be trustworthy, to earn that trust, you really need to have trustworthy goals in mind. And that means you need to be thinking about security and reliability. You need to be thinking about accountability and oversight. So those governance goals need to be there. And then you need to be thinking about how that system can be inclusive, ethical, and responsible. Uh, how the use of the system can be uh, as responsible as possible, how you're, you're building ethics into, into the development of these technological systems. And so with those goals in mind, the next question is, how do you get there? And we started out, like I said, uh, with cybersecurity, um, but like I, like I said before, it's broader than that, right? You have to have effective cybersecurity measures, but you also have to have privacy protection. You have to ensure transparency. You have to ensure that there's redressability in the case of harms. Uh, you have to make sure that the system you're creating, and this is really important uh, discussion going on in AI and other places as well, you have to make sure that it's audible. How do you know uh, that it's doing what it's meant to be doing? Um, you have to build in mechanisms for fairness, uh, as well as you know, mechanisms for interoperability. And finally, there's a safety component. All of these together are the things you need to do to meet the kind of expectations people have 
around digital products and services. And if you if you kind of judge these things right, if you build it out with the right goals in mind, then you're on your way to building uh, a trustworthy digital system. You know, I this may be very basic. I'm not sure that I knew in undergrad what a framework was. I mean, I had I I, I was a I'm thinking through like when I think about framework, I think it's a useful rubric for us to kind of even define. And and maybe I'll bring it up to say a framework's just sort of the lens you force yourself through when you're evaluating a problem. And I think it is so useful in these cases because you mentioned interoperability and we saw that circle there are trade-offs that you have to make. So it is useful to think about all of them because you could be, you could be going nuts on the privacy front and lose some capacity on safety. You know, I, I, if you read the journal this morning about um, the, one of the social, one of the biggest social media platforms, you know, how, how they figure, how they work through safety issues requires some compromise on privacy because you need to identify age. And I think that becomes tricky, but these are very complicated sort of nuanced and very interdependent and dynamic fields. So how do you get, how do you make it simple? And and we, well, you need to be thoughtful and go through, you know, sort of all of the, the vectors, I think, of the framework. But also, if you're a CEO, how do you even begin on this stuff? And how do you make it simple enough to say, yes, I need to prioritize this right now? Right. And I think, like, you've, you've probably seen this a ton of times, right? Some of this stuff's just not simple. And that's why you need that. That's why you need a kind of framework to guide your thinking, because it's easy to, like you said, ignore parts of the the equation for trustworthiness in favor of others that seem a little more present or more simple as as you're talking through. That's why, it, it, you know, if you're going to make decisions that affect millions of people's lives, that affect how we use technology going forward, that have the potential to harm people if they go wrong. And it's incumbent on you to, to make decisions that involve a lot of complexity. And decisions that involve complexity are hard for people to kind of get around. Uh, and that's why, like you asked earlier, that's why the, the framework is an important way to think it through, because it makes sure that things that are vital don't fall through the cracks. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that you've, you've, you've had a ton of experience at working through these things with, with folks at McKinsey as well. I mean, it's funny. I, I do. I work, I, I talk to CEOs and counsel them on how to think through this. And, and I think getting started is it's helpful to think through what's achievable. Where's the value? You know, what, what are you trying to do from an innovation standpoint? But it's also very easy to shift into my, <laughs> I'm a mom of twins. So that also is very easy. And I think to myself, well, I really would like, I would really like these companies, especially the tech companies, and especially the ones that my children are using. I'd really like them to go through the uncomfortable difficult, you know, thoughts of how are we going to manage these things? And I think one of the levers for this is there is new responsibility on behalf of the board and the, you know, the C-suite on what decisions they make and don't make in this area. And I think that's something that's very, um, will become very real to folks. I mean, um, not to go too into the weeds on Caremark, but the original, the original, you know, Delaware decision on board liability is typically linked to, or it has been linked frequently to cyber, like lack of cyber controls. And we saw this morning, you know, the, the cyber framework come out of the White House and say, there's going to be increasing, you know, liability on behalf of the tech companies to, to make sure that these platforms are safe and trustworthy. So I think that we're going to see folks being willing to dive into the elements of the framework. I'll, maybe I'll share the, the second, you know, the next, the page of it to, you could talk through like how you think of, what are the set of, th of, things that folks need to think through to start making this work, to, to start engaging in a, in, a, in a coherent framework. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this gets back to the, those goals. Um, but absolutely, uh, I think companies especially, or anyone who's developing technology, like you might be an independent like technology developer, you may be writing software right now. We would really appreciate if you started thinking through the way you develop you know, individual technologies, platforms, uses of technology, if you had you know, other goals than speed to market in mind when you're developing these technologies, and those goals include ensuring it's secure and reliable. That, that first one, I think, is, um, is where regulation is, is having the greatest sway right now, yeah. right? Like you mentioned, Caremark, the SEC in the US is, um, is promulgating proposed rules that are gonna go into effect, requiring boards especially to be reported to on cybersecurity. And, 
then explain to their shareholders how they're how they're doing that and how they're dealing with cyber resilience issues. Appropriately um, so. Appropriately so, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, in in the the other goal around having good governance around these things, that includes you know corporate governance and sort of the G in the whole ESG conversation that we see everywhere. Um, that applies to technology too. Um, you need to have good governance, and you need to build into the technology the ability to have that governance to make it real. And um, tech and data, ability. right? Like data yeah. stewardship for sure goes into the governance piece because that's one of the biggest assets that companies have. Exactly. Like it's not just the the right thing to do. It's also often a, a regulatory requirement for a lot of data both, uses, right? Both, yeah, required appropriately and the right thing to do. Yes. Absolutely. And then you know the the last goal about making sure that's inclusive, ethical, and responsible. You know that that gets into the, the heart of what is trustworthy, um, whether it comports with the values that I hold uh, as a society. I mean, the the more we mediate our engagement with each other, with you know government agencies, with businesses, the more those are mediated by technology, the more this uh, idea of inclusive, ethical, and responsible use comes into play, uh, and the more it becomes just a, kind of a baseline requirement of what you need to do as an organization. Uh, in order to be trustworthy. And it, I think, you know, Liz, I know you've done research on this and, and people's expectations, especially when they're dealing with technology. Do you want to share some of that? Yeah, I mean, our research from last year on digital trust showed that really it, trust is for companies to lose. We we had some hypotheses going into the research and some of them were validated and some of them were disproven. Interestingly, I think one of the interesting things for me is we consulted an ethicist at Oxford University and he was saying one of the driving ethical considerations for data stewardship is to give the consumer autonomy. And that sounded right. We thought, absolutely. That makes sense. We want to have control. We want it's our data. You know, we want to have control over it. What we found in our research is that actually folks don't like me, including me, don't want to mess with our cookie settings. And we don't want to get in there and optimize for our own privacy because it is time consuming and confusing. And you don't know if it's worth the time and you just want to order the thing from anthropology, whatever it is. You, you just want to get get it done. What consumers do want is they want to know that the organizations they patronize are taking care of it loosely. Just, we, we, you know, we did sort of qualitative in, interviews and they just wanna know that they're doing the right thing. And they also assume that companies are doing the right thing. 89% of consumers think that the, the businesses they patronize are taking care of the security, reliability, you know, all, all, all across the framework. So really it's up to companies um, to lose that trust and that is really also sort of a human bias to say, well, I'm patronizing this company and thus I believe it is trustworthy because, because I chose it. And so it's something that may be implicit in us, but when we find an organization not worthy of that trust, if they break the trust, consumers will pivot. So we saw, I mean, I am very, um, just very busy mom, Career, to, you know, two career family. I care about delivery time a lot because I just want to know that it's going to come and plug it into the family, you know, ecosystem. So we found that consumers <laughs> weigh trust, and we define this as you know confidence they're taking care of data and making good decisions with the technology. Trust is almost as important to consumers as delivery time and price, which is a very very big finding. So I guess I would ask you this, uh, Daniel, who do you? think is more interested in digital trust at this point, at this point in time, organizations or consumers? So I think, I think when you, when you define it as just like the concept of digital trust, I think organizations, companies, um, especially leading companies are deeply uh, interested in this. I think like Jim said at the beginning of our, of our talk, right? Trust is eroding. It's at historical lows for everything for, you know, historical low trust in government, historical low trust in uh, companies in, in technology, in science itself. So I think organizations that uh, are based, especially in, in the application of technology and development of science, um, they're keenly interested in questions of how they how they can earn digital trust or for less advanced companies, how they just get it, right? how it just appear, materializes out of nowhere almost. Um, I think if you break down the issues, kind of like, like you did in, in your survey, Consumers are also really interested in digital trust. They just don't call it that. They're interested in being taken care of, that they're interested in having their expectations met, that I'm engaged in a financial transaction. I want to buy you know, a book for my kid or something. I did not sign up for you to you know, release my 
my uh, financial data to all these hackers and cyber criminals. Uh, I signed up to buy a book from you and that's all I want. And I trust you to do that uh, yeah. until you you fail that trust. And I think uh, because there's that trust in the companies people engage in that you found, there's a long way to fall. Um, so I think it, it's mixed. Um, I think the, the concept itself, and I don't know if you've seen this too, right? The concept itself as a package, I think companies and you know those sort of senior leaders and the CEO um, or the C-suite are starting to get, um, but the the concepts that fall into digital trust, I think that's something that's almost universal. Yeah, I think to take it to a more nuanced place, because I've been bringing us to the basics, but to, to go into a nuanced place, I think the thing that <clears throat> when I think through some of the problems that we don't see, that it's hard to see the impact of the problems, but we will see it later, is something that I've seen referred to in academic press as um, algorithmic shadows. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you train it, a train a model, say, say I have, I've said this very publicly and I will continue to say it because it's easy to, I have celiac. <clears throat> I have celiac disease, so my body is an autoimmune response to gluten. It's not an allergy, it's an autoimmune. I just don't eat gluten, it's fine. It's like, I can pretend it's just like a trendy diet, but it's not fine in other ways. And, um, and so if a model were trained on my data and conclusions were reached, and then if I, under the data privacy laws of our country, of the US, if I ask for a company with owning the model and developing the model to remove my data, um, they need to. But the model that's been trained on my data, and what if that model then discovers that there is a link between those with celiac and something <clears throat> that makes me uninsurable or something that makes me less hireable or so, you know, some, something that would point to a de cognitive decline, whatever it is, then it's too late. The insight is derived. Or if I'm in the cohort, I didn't offer my data as a celiac uh, person, but I, but, but my, but others that have it did. And then this, these conclusions are reached. So I think the, the secondary and tertiary impacts of how algorithms being trained goes into the trust equation. And I, and I think the only way we're going to discover if companies are trustworthy on these fronts is by sort of, well, increased transparency requirements so that you can, so that root cause analysis is possible. And I wonder how you think of, um, you know, that's, that's not something that you can say to an organization, hey, are you concerned with your algorithmic shadow, uh, you know, track record? But, and I don't think that the regulators are really there yet either. I think they're trying to piece together some, some of the lowest common denominator stuff, like data privacy. How do you think of helping organizations uh, think through the hard stuff and think through sort of farther, farther term impact. And then I have a, a question that I'd love to ask as you frame your question. What does the forum think about their own responsibility in sort of advancing the thought leadership here? Like, I know that you don't necessarily advise clients the way McKinsey does, but I'd love to think of how you think vocationally, because I know you do, about the work that you do and helping people get to the management of these complex issues. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's that's a lot to unpack. So the, I think that when, when we think about uh, transparency, especially, which is I think what exactly what you're getting at, companies who are, who are developing these technologies, who are taking in all this data, really need to think about, and it, I think it's, a, it's their job to think about what is gonna, what they're gonna do with it in the future and how to explain that to users, to the people giving, giving their data up. Um, they also, if they find new uses uh, of the data that are helpful to society as a whole, this is where consent becomes hugely important. And yeah. the way we get consent, you've seen, right, in, in, in privacy, I think we both practiced in privacy for a while, um, you know, privacy consent is, is all over the place. And it's uh, that itself uh, with, with regard to digital technologies, it's like this burgeoning field. Um, that there are a number of different ways to think about uh, models of consent, but we really need to really need companies to explain what they mean by consent, what you're consenting to, and what you're not consenting to. And yes, that might make it that might in, uh, increase the friction a little bit in doing business, but that might be what's required in building a more trustworthy system. And I guess the way that you asked, the way the forum thinks about this, mm -hmm. uh, the way the forum thinks about trustworthy technology as a whole is you know, just a very brief primer on the forum is that we're a multi-stakeholder organization. That means that we um, believe that the best decisions are made um, at the, at the, at the, in the congruence of, of the private sector, big companies, you know, small companies, um, the government sector, so, you know, leading governments, uh, as well as individuals. 
you know, regular consumers, regular citizens. And the more we can come together to make decisions, the better off we'll be. Um, so representing everyone who has a stake in a certain set of decisions is absolutely vital for us. And the trustworthiness of our digital systems upon which we base essentially the, you know, definitely the underpinnings of our economy and increasing the underpinnings of our society as a whole, um, making sure those systems is trustworthy is absolutely one of those issues where everybody has a stake. So how do we, how do yeah. we push so, forward so the thought leadership here, right? Um, it's developing models like this. It's helping people understand what what the what their responsibilities are, where their responsibilities lie, how to think through some of these really difficult issues, and not lose sight of the fact that ultimately these technologies are made for people. They're made to serve the interest of individuals and um, right. regular folks. And if they don't, then that's a significant problem. And that's where the issue of trustworthiness comes into play, right? Because it's when technologies don't serve regular people. When they, when they actually harm people, that's when they lose trust. And that's ultimately where the companies that use those technologies also lose trust. You know, I'm, it's so interesting to think, I always think, yes, that makes complete sense on the organizational, like private sector, public sector, private sector, public sector. That you, but what I love when you bring in the individual consumer too, and I know that the forum has done great work in this space to give folks a common language. And maybe that's part of what a framework is use, useful for. Like, can we just agree on the terms here? Can we just agree on what we're going to call things? And then we have a discussion. We know we are referring to the same things that could advance the ball and what, you know, what's some good planning around this. I guess, I guess the question being like, that and more, what, you know, what use, utility of a framework to represent all three of these, well, universal stakeholder group, right? But like bucketed by corporate or private sector, public sector, and then, and then all of us, all of us on the call, all of us listening, all of us watching on YouTube later. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I mean, that common language point is, is hugely important. Uh, and having, having touchstones about what you mean when you say trust or digital trust, already that helps to start the work of building trust. Yeah. And I think you all have done work to say, let's talk about it this way and let's start measuring it and let's start creating like, you know, measures of success. What does good look like? Can we define that? Tell us more about the work that you're thinking through as you, you know, as you really develop and promulgate this throughout society, which I love that you're doing. And I'm such a big fan of course, you know this. Um, yeah. Tell us more about how you think through like sort of once you've got the framework, which I think is really built out beautifully, how do you what, how do you take it forward? What happens next? Right, and, and you're absolutely right. So for for a number of years, uh, I was a school teacher, and ultimately, if you don't get a grade on something, then students don't remember it, right? And that flows through to all of the rest of our lives. If you don't measure something, or you're not measured against something, you're not going to do it. Um, so there are measurements for components of what we think of as digital trust, right? There's robust like cybersecurity frameworks and standards out there. There's requirements, there's privacy compliance. All these things exist. Uh, the question, and this gets back to what we were talking about before, the question is how do you apply judgment when they're all implicated in one set of decisions? Uh, and that's what we're trying to measure now, uh, trying to develop a measure of overall trustworthiness of the decisions we make regarding these technologies. So how effectively uh, did you weigh people's expectations of cybersecurity against their interoperability, against privacy, or you know, improving privacy uh, yeah. and others? And how do you how do you create that more holistic, I guess, measurement system? So that's what we're that's what we're working on right now. Um, and you know, in the near future, we'll have more to say about that. I'm going to bring a use case to bear. Let's talk about generative AI because no one else is. Um, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's such ubiquity and it, it's so, it's really fun to think about. It's really fun to play, play with. Um, I just keep getting re reports from my husband about things he's talking with you, Judge, which he, that's my, now my competitor in my husband's mind here. But I think, um, I think folks are now really thinking about, well, what if this does that? And what if it does that? And there's so many beautiful use cases like elder companion care. I just love that. I love the beautiful work that um, you can use AI with autistic children. There's so many great use cases. And then of course, like performance off the charts kind of use cases, but let's think about the risk um, and maybe how you might think through this framework and the work that you're doing with it as applied to Gen AI. Yeah, I think there's, what's interesting about the, the general AI conversation is that there are 
there's a before, there's a you know a, an in an in development and a sort of and a, and a current state, right? Um, there are some significant, I think, trustworthiness issues in the development of generative AI. And, and one example is, you know, in order to train these um, these large language models, right? You had to take out stuff that was undesirable. You don't want Chat GPT or whatever repeating to you things from like the darkest corners of the internet that you know might be harmful for people to experience, right? In order to find those things, all of these generative AI developers um, needed humans to look at some of those sources and mark them as bad, right? Yeah. We didn't. I don't think we've spent enough time thinking about the potential psychological harm of those original test subjects, folks who were generally in the uh, in the developing world who were working for very little money with very little support who were looking at these things that we we decided were too harmful for the future users of ai but somehow they're okay for these folks who are um, are either in africa or south america or asia um, that's already a significant trust issue at the very inception of these technologies that's something that for future technologies i this framework that we've developed would hopefully prevent. It would require that kind of thought. Who is getting harmed by this technology? Ideally, it would be as few people as possible. And when we think about how the harms are spread out, there's some fairness mechanism for determining that. It's not just because you're poor, you should be harmed by this technology as we develop it. So that's the first, I think that's the first thing about ChatGP. But we've now that we've developed these language models, now that they're in use, um, I think we see a whole host of kind of trustworthiness issues. One, uh, is around accuracy, right? We've seen a lot of question about how, you know, you can enter a question in chat GPT and it seems like it knows the answer, but it's actually feeding you information that's gotten from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, is it feeding the misinformation problem? And do we know how to redress that? Do we know how to audit whether it's giving accurate information? Um, do we understand how to be transparent about, and I think actually the transparency bit um, the companies that are using it have actually done a pretty good job of being transparent about what it's good for, what it's, it's what it's going to be used for, and what what, what the bot what, itself what it, says. What, right? what it is and what it isn't, and how how far along it is. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I think for transparency, they've been pretty good about that. I think these other questions of redressability, if you, if you really require an answer, and you go to Chat GPT for that answer, and it's wrong, and that harms you, how do you be, how are you made whole after that? I think that's an open question we have, and that's something we need to develop. Uh, a, uh, a set of procedures around or processes to, to make that happen. Um, so that's that's some of the way I think how to apply this framework to chat GPT. Now you, you work, how do, how do you think we could we could apply some of these ideas to things like generative AI? I hadn't thought about the content moderation. I had a, a good friend who, who prosecuted crimes against children for DOJ, for Department of Justice. And she said that all of her colleagues um, had mandatory monthly counseling sessions. And I thought, right. And I hadn't thought about how much into the depths of sort of some dark areas you have to go to keep others safe and, and what a toll that takes. And I hadn't thought about it actually in terms of, you know, content moderation and safety with, with large language models. So I'm glad that you brought it up. I do think of, um, I have good friends who are educators and I think it's easy to, it's easy to sort of future trip over what this will replace. And it's true. This is going to this is going to, lots of folks will have to pivot as with all sort of shifts as you know, as, as we find in, in technology shifts. And um, I mean, gosh, even dating back to like the printing press, but we, but yes, that's true. And I do think of the, the talent implications. Um, I think those are very, those are very near term, like people's livelihoods and people's ability to pivot. And also just secondarily, does our education system support or promote you know, folks' abilities to to get retrained or be open to it or to think that they have to and who's saying what. And I think some of the talent issues are probably top of mind for me from a from a um from a risk outside of of the the, the performance itself. I think of course <laughs> elucidation thing is funny until it's until it's harmful. Like you know, you just like what? You just made that up. Um <laughs> which you know, could be said for like lots of public speakers that they just, I, I think what is very interesting about the trends though is from a, from a um, you know, the debate about the, the assistant saying, the AI assistant saying, I love you. The first, the first thing that came to mind for me is, you know, you counsel youth about when you're dating, 
you know, people might use these terms to get this response. And, um, and I think that that brought to mind for me emotional manipulation and how easily large language models will be able to read us, read humans, like, and say, what, well, what do they want to hear? And I feel like that's at the heart of the hallucination. It's like, well, what do you, I want to give you an answer because you want an answer. It might not be the right answer, but I'll give you something. And then I think about behavioral nudging and how much I give my, you know, my smartwatch the ability to tell me when to stand and to go work out and close the rings. And I'm grateful for that. I need the reminders, but when does emotional manipulation, which is possible, not not because of bad intent, it's a, human, it's a computer, but how, how do you prevent behavioral nudging from being amplified <laughs> off the charts where they know how to, they know how we work as humans, like psychology is learnable. And that's the thing I think that I'm probably most attuned to. And it goes, I mean, it just goes to like the algorithm, like the TikTok algorithm just is very advanced. And, and it, you linger you know, one time, two, one more fraction of a second, and then you get fed a ton. So they, the algorithm can spot when we, our, our attention can be diverted. And that at scale uh, makes me think, so I'm, I'm highlighting a problem, but let me talk about a solution. A solution, I guess, is it really, let's talk about the framework and let's talk about, let's bring the, all of these issues together and say, okay, well, we've noticed that this is gonna be a problem. Let's name the problem. And then let's start piecing through the solution and you know planning out all the pieces and i love i love frameworks for that because you can't it's hard to keep it all in your head unless you have these these groups of things together let me just bring up the last page of your um of your uh framework because i find it very useful um let me just grab the last page i think it's useful to talk through here's all here are all the things that we're saying um, we want to talk through cyber, transparency, safety, fairness, privacy, redressability, interoperability, and auditability. These all need to, these all need to work together. Like we all need to focus on all of these issues. Pick pick one of these, if you will, Daniel, and 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 say like, how would you apply? Let's say, how would you apply fairness to ChatGPT? Sure, I think um, there, right? That the it gets to from the from inception to use, right? I think we already covered the fairness issues at, in the development, right? And in the, in the sort of content moderation part of GPT. But now there's the, the fairness part uh, of, of its actual use in practice. And I think your emotional manipulation point is, is a great one. Um, is it fair that a, a young person who doesn't have as much experience can be manipulated by ChatGPT in a way that maybe an older person with, with less experience would not be? Um, I think most people would say that's not. Uh, that's not fair. Even thinking about treating like people uh, similarly, uh, which is you know one way to think about fairness, um, treating all users the same, you know, requires some safeguards we put around how manipulative you're going to allow a particular uh, chat bot to be. Um, so I think that's one way fairness is implicated. The other, I think, is in the uses of chat GPT. I think that there's going to be people who uh, are able to use current uh, current versions of these uh, AI language models. Um, and there's gonna be people who are not able to use yeah, those. That's a great point. How do we ensure that the, the folks who um, have access to them don't sort of leapfrog the rest of the world that's a good point. Um, in their use and, and, have, and, and reap those benefits? So there's, there's a, those are a couple of, I think, big fairness issues that should be highlighted if you think about these you know, technology uses in terms of the framework. Yeah, one thing I love about the the gravitas that the forum holds in the world is, um, by the way, every time I think of World Economic Forum, I think of um, if you've read Kevin Kwan's books about um, I, I, what, what's one in the series about it was Crazy Rich Asians, and then it went to um, and he talks about like the inner ring of the inner ring of the inner ring is like the right badge at the forum. Um, but I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad for that global gravity because because of the redressability point where if you all are saying this has to be this has to be discussed this has to be handled it, it promotes i think a global reckoning of yes we have to make it when there's a problem which people i think are very i think people are very um clear on like raising they don't know the full extent of what the implications are no one does but but i think folks are clear on what they think believe to be you know problems and i think it starts with growing awareness on data privacy rights. And I think maybe those in Germany have maybe an advanced advanced view on, on 
you know, rights and obligations, for, you know, more so than like developing countries as you, as you raised earlier. But I love the thought that someone has to be able to say to someone, hey, this is not right, make it right. And I think from a consumer standpoint, we can vote with our feet, we can shop somewhere else, or we can, um, you know, raise issues on social media if we don't like something that's make a loud kind of voice on social media, especially if you have a following. But I love how, you know, you can gain alignment across public and private sector around, okay, well, if this goes wrong, who's, who's in charge and who has to make it right? Who's responsible? And what, and what are the ramifications if it goes wrong? So maybe if we could just talk through, and I know we're going to turn this over to Jim for questions, but maybe just talk through the concepts of liability. Like when we think about trust, it's great to go in normatively and say, let's do all these things to make it trustworthy. But what if it's not? Who's in charge? Who's, you know, and if you thought, have thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to, to the extent that we can use such influence that we have, if it, you know, where, where it exists uh, to ensure that, you know, the decisions that folks who are, you know, running companies or, you know, are, are in charge of governments are more human centric and more focused on trustworthiness, then I think that that's a great success. Um, I think when, when we look at issues of redressability, you're absolutely right. I think the way you described it as like, when things go wrong, you have to have a plan, right? Um, and that's that's part of redressability because sometimes things go wrong and they'll impact the, the developer, the technology, the technology itself. Sometimes things go wrong and they impact regular citizens or users or a person on the street, right? You brought up self-driving cars, right? Sometimes if, if we're testing self-driving cars on public streets and I'm a pedestrian, I did not sign up for this experiment. Um, and if I get hit by a car because it's not able to stop itself, I deserve to have some redress mechanism. That needs to be a, an issue of policy so that right, you need to create liability structures around this. It also needs to be a part of strategy. And I think that second part is one that has been too often neglected. So I think that's a really important part of what we develop as this framework here is as, you're, as part of your strategy, when you're developing a technology, when you're applying a technology, using some new kind of digital technology, you need to have a strategy that includes if things go wrong. It can't just be like a sunny side, technology yeah. will fix everything sort of strategy. It has to be a strategy that says, if this, if this goes wrong, we have a mechanism by which people can let us know and that with which we can then help them to, to fix whatever the problem was. And it doesn't have to be something as drastic as like a problem to life or limb. It could be if you, if you leak their personal data or if you get, uh, if uh, in the US, right, in credit reporting, if you get their credit report wrong, um, there needs to be a way to fix that. And that's the heart of redressability. Build in a way to fix things if they go wrong or if you made the wrong decision. Yeah, I mean, the life and limb point is good. I get annoyed when I've unsubscribed from something and it just persists. And I think like, okay, well, you can't even keep mailing lists straight. What else are you doing with my data? I think that that right. just becomes, it, it kind of, I, I love the food metaphor, um, but like if you think that something, one of the ingredients of a multi-ingredient recipe has been tainted, you're like, nope, no thank you on that food. So I think we should also say, you know, you see one aspect of lack of trust in an organization, you can extrapolate from there, but, and there, and there has to be, and, and the test of it is not, is an organization breach or not, because that's just a sort of, a, it feels like a fatal complaint for, for every organization, that's a matter of when, but what do they do when they say? And I think two, two follow-up questions, and, and then Jim would love to have you join in, but one is, um, how can, how can folks, organizations be transparent about the, and I think we saw this with like you, you mentioned it with what open AI said it chat GPT was and was not yes that was very open and transparent it was great to see how can organizations be transparent about trust and and then just maybe that last point around auditability like what storytelling are organizations going to do and I think of audits as really as a storytelling exercise it's like here's our work let me talk you through it so those two points around um transparency and auditability yeah, I think transparency is really, I think, the crux of a lot of this, um, a lot of this conversation around trust. You can do these things well, and if no one knows it, you might end up not being seen as trustworthy. So I think companies, especially, need to have um, a better way um, 
to to get some of these points across. And it's not enough just to you know put a bunch of information on a web page or something. The transparency needs to be it needs to be real. It needs to be active. It needs to be something people can actually use. And I think there's there's a number you know transparency outside of technology, right? Again, something old. Um, the way you communicate with your stakeholders is something that we've been talking about for a long time. You know, if we're lawyers, right? California rules of court require to use regular standard language. They don't let you use Latin and things like that. That's a transparency mechanism. These things, same things can be applied to technology, right? Um, privacy rules, explanations of your, you know, how secure your organization is and how you prioritize security, um, the rules around redressability, all those need to be made available and very clear to the user uh, or else you may be doing a good job. You may not, we don't know if it's not transparent or if it's not clear. Um, and I think, you know, audibility is, is um, in some ways the sort of internal side of that. How, how are you developing these technologies in a way that's transparent to you, the person who owns there or the company that owns them? Um, how do you make sure that your technology is doing what you say it is yeah. and not doing anything that you say it's not doing? Um, and you, so that, you that's ultimately Roger, audibility. Like yeah. This, you could be like who in the organization, someone probably knows, like someone right. at the organization knows what the technology is doing and not doing, but many times that isn't, hasn't, that hasn't filtered upward. So it's also like, how do you make sure with one knows, everyone knows, or the right people know. And that goes to, I think, some of the, some of the work to do, like creating distribution mechanisms through of this information. And that's where you see people like, you know, they're increasingly, right? Like digital trust officers or chief trust officers yes, we, or whatever, yes, whose great job point. it is to know these that's things. That's our job. Um, go find, go yeah. find the things out. Let the people that need to know, know the things. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, Jim. All right. So I hate to interrupt, but I don't because uh, we should uh, get to some questions here. Although this has been a great discussion, I am going to abuse the power of the chair and ask my question first, which is that a lot of what you have been talking about, you make this explicit in your framework has to do with notions of being uh, inclusive, being ethical, being responsible. Uh, I was trained as a philosopher, so I know that for 4,000 years, we've been trying to figure out what any of these things mean and have been spectacularly unsuccessful. And then I've also been a developer for a long time, and so need to have really somewhat precise definitions of these things if I'm going to be able to put them into my code. So how do you balance the notions of inclusivity, ethical nature, uh, responsibility to make them anything but vacuous truth, justice, and the American way in a way that is actionable for the people that are doing the work. Yeah, an easy I question think, to start with. Yeah, that was no no problem at all. Um, we're going to solve philosophy in like next ten seconds, and then we'll be, and we can all move on with our lives. But I think ultimately, um, we don't we don't ascribe to any single notion. Right. Um, of we're not going to define what fairness means for everyone. But the idea is that you in developing these technologies have to have a working definition of what you mean when something's inclusive or what you mean when it's fair. You need to be transparent about what that is and you need to be able to be held accountable to it. So, you know, privacy, notions of fairness, they they, you know, they don't vary just between philosophy, right? they vary between individuals, they vary between geographies, different people have different ideas what it is. That's why we're, we hinge very closely to the idea of expectations. Different people have expectations for what's fair and how technology enables that kind of fairness. For if you're developing a technology, if you're the CEO of a company that's building in technologies, what we're saying is you need to define what fairness is for the purposes of your technology. You need to be accountable to that definition. It needs to be something clear, transparent uh, to the people who are going to use it. And you need to have mechanisms or redressability mechanisms for them to hold you accountable uh, to those to those definitions that you yourself have created. Um, and ultimately, people will choose which technologies they use and how they use them based on how well they uh, they fit into their own expectations around what fairness or what these other concepts are. Great pivot. Nicely done. So a cluster of questions have come in from a number of the uh, uh, of, of the listeners on this. Uh, having to do with who do you think does this well now? Can you are, are there are there any examples of companies that are building trust in a way that you think is exemplary? I might take this one. Yeah, it's yeah, let's work with a lot of companies. It's so motivating to see. I think um, we see companies who have taken early stances on values-driven um, platforms, and um, 
you know, they've done it with sustainability. They've done it with, um, you know, just engagement with their consumers in a, in a very like intimate way where they have, um, they have a trust relationship already and they're leaning into it. And then they've extended those sort of values first principles to, um, to trust, you know, data and digital. And I think, um, you know, you could argue back and forth, this is cabined in ESG. I, I would say it's broader than ESG because it's, it's so foundational to, to everything that you're doing. But what I think the, 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 the archetype of the company doing this well is someone who, uh, you know, an organization that says, here's what we have right now from a risk perspective, from an audit perspective, from a compliance and capabilities and talent perspective. Here are the ways that people work together. You know, so far it's cross-functional. And it's, right now it, it's fit for purpose for our ambition, but here's our future ambition and here's our innovation roadmap. What we know we need to do is every time our innovation roadmap goes hockey stick style up, we have to commensurately, you know, ramp up all of the trust foundations, you know, at scale. It's hard to do that at scale. So you have to be very intentional. It does not happen accidentally. And that involves hiring, that involves, you know, creating roles like, you know, Daniel, you mentioned the chief digital trust officer. That's a signal that an organization is saying, yes, we're going to, we're going to know. We're going to know what we're doing on these fronts. Someone is in charge of this. Someone is in charge of advising the board. And it's broader than cyber. It, it covers all of our use of data and, and technology. So every time I see an organization that is already mapping the trust growth and scalability with their innovation, you know, growth and scalability, that to me is a mark of success. And I would also point out, it is wonderful when an organization is transparent because the transparency requires clarity first. You can't communicate something that you're not clear on what you're saying. So, you know, if, if an organization is going to say it, it's gone through a lot of channels. You know, it's got, it's come out of probably like the chief technology officer has it, like, you know, the gym of the world has signed off on it. Then you've had, you know, the comms people look at it, legal has looked at it. So by the time it gets to the consumer, you, that's a thoughtful approach. So transparency is a good signal of, we know these are issues. We are going after them, and here's our ambition. That, so those are all really good signs of success. All right, here's a question from uh, Paula Katkin. She says, the lion's share accountability and responsibility lies with corporations and government, but isn't it also critical to educate the public about how, when, where, by whom their data is collected and used? Uh, most people are unaware of the scale of this, and how do we change that? And I, I, I would add in... Even the people who are aware seem to be unconcerned in in serious ways. So I think I'll, I'll take I'll take the first thing. I think that I, I agree um, with a, a few caveats. Right, um, one the agree that the lion's share of accountability and responsibility lies with big corporations and the government. That's how it should be, right? In in uh, in law, especially we have the concept of like the least cost avoider. Right, it is the cheapest, easiest for big companies who build these technologies to build them in such a way that users aren't harmed. They're the least cost avoider. They should be responsible for these things. Um, that being said, it's also absolutely true that we need to educate the public about how to use technology in a way that uh, supports their own needs and purposes and doesn't ultimately harm them. Sometimes I'm hesitant about this because individuals are already, especially individuals who um, are you know, less privileged, who come from backgrounds uh, without the kind of support that, that some folks who uh, develop these kind of technologies do, those folks, they're already drowning in responsibility for so many things. So adding on new yeah. responsibilities related to technology just isn't fair by almost any definition. Um, so yes, we need to do more education. Um, that education itself is an additional responsibility, I think of governments and the companies who develop these technologies. So yes, people are unaware, um, we don't have the right education mechanisms in place. We need to improve that, but that doesn't take anybody else who's developing these technologies or whose purpose is to govern these technologies off the hook. Yeah, I think when I talk, when I advise clients on sort of who are the stakeholder groups that they need to think through, like what scrutiny should they expect for the work that they're doing? There is board scrutiny. There is, you know, class action, like plaintiff's attorneys to scrutiny, there's certainly the regulator scrutiny. But one of the ones we always remind is also watchdog organization scrutiny. Again, appropriate, because I love your point, Daniel, that it should not, the burden should not sit on the groups that are being systematically excluded to raise the flag. That is not appropriate at all. I don't want to use, the, I'm using that word too much, but I, it is, 
it is a burden on top of burden on top of burden. And there has to be, it is a good and healthy thing to have um, sort of exposés where there are systematic exclusions from things like medical care and insurance and employment and housing. That is a great thing. So I think if organizations know that the sort of the, the, the 360 degree scrutiny is coming at them, that's good. It will it will drive the change that organizations should be pursuing altruistically. But you know, they're they're there for for commercial re reasons. But so I think all those levers are are very useful in helping to protect the consumer. And I and I think it will continue to grow because I think people are riveted when they see something like that. Uh, got a got a fun question from uh, Giovanni Molina here which I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, so with the explosion of AI, is that going to help or hurt the notion of trustworthiness here? Yes. <laughs> so look, I think, you know, with, with the, with the more AI, and that's a, a vast area, right. Of, of technologies that are, that are being developed. I think there are potential um, risks to overall trustworthiness, depending on the rules we develop around AI, um, speaking of governments and sort of the governance coming from the board and others. So there are significant risks to trustworthiness because um, this is where auditability is significantly implicated, right? If we if we don't, if we kind of like black box what's going on in these algorithms and don't know how they're developing and how they're, uh, and how they're being used, then that's a real risk to trust. On the other side, these AI, you know, models and developments have the potential to to really uh, improve a lot of folks' lives, and that increases trust in technology over overall. Um, so there's there's both ends, and it, ultimately, it doesn't depend on the technology. It depends on the decisions we make about the technology, about whether it improves trust or decreases it. I think it's shocking that, and these figures are just sort of newly newly public. <laughs> the consumers prefer AI. They trust AI more. I think because they assume that the AI itself is bias free and thus they assume it's been tested and gone through a trust framework, but but they're not necessarily extrapolating like, you know, uh, the training data is biased. The, the, it's just, it's it's too much of a, a an initial leap. They will learn, folks will learn, we will all learn, but it is um, at the moment it feels like, well, the AI bot will be fair because it's just a bot. They don't have any, you know, they don't, they're not gonna react to my impatience on the phone or my, you know, whatever it is. And I think that's something we're going to start to see more of, um, you know, as and to answer the direct question, I think the risk is going sky high uh, with with the with the promulgation of AI at this speed and scale. I think the I provocatively I will say this feels like the Trojan horse where like because every organization is going to want to use it at some point for fear of being left behind, they have to get after these trust foundations now because it's just time like this was the trigger it, it was time before it's not that this is new it's just that this is going so fast and that i think the risks are so um compounding that it's it is just something that folks will have to address all right so there are some good questions that are left and unfortunately we're going to have to leave them because uh we're coming to the end of our time so i am going to give each of you 30 seconds to sum up one thought that you want to leave the audience with and then we're going to turn it back over to Jennifer. So you have 30 seconds. Uh, Daniel, you start. Sure. So uh, if, if you want more information first, uh, the name of the report from the forum is Earning Digital Trust. And that kind of sums up what we're talking about. Trust is something that you earn. It's a decision that you make. It's not a specific technology. It's not a specific use. It's all about humans making decisions that prioritize other humans in technology use. Over you, Liz. Yeah, that was 22 seconds. Liz, you, you you can take up the extra eight. Here you go. I'll make the appeal to the leaders that I know who are on the call. Come join this. Come join this profession. Come join this. Like, do a philosophy course and do your computer science course. Come grapple with issues of law and ethics. And this is something that is, law will be completely reinvented because there are a whole new range of case law that, that needs to come. Come study this, do this, and make it a make it a one of your possibilities is to think through career choices because we need folks that are really committed to this and it's a really really rich and incredible area to develop thought leadership all right so thank you daniel thank you liz uh this has been a great discussion 
I'm sure there are going to be uh, lots of discussions following up on this inside this community. I will now turn it over to Jennifer. All right. Well, before we end today, I just want to mention that our next seminar is at 1.30 p.m. on March 23rd, and we'll cover data ethics, leaders, and frameworks. Uh, so thanks once again to our speakers, our moderator, and our audience. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon.